Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We are here in Eindhoven, live in the studio at the Dutch Design Week, at uh, an event that is hosted by the Ratenau Institute. The main question today is, how can we enrich reality by means of technologies such as VR, AR and speech? My name is Doya Sneiders, and today we're going to speak about this uh, question. Why? Because we think that they're fundamental questions for now and for the times to come. We see these technologies all around us more and more. They're creeping into our houses. We've all um, used our face filters on our phones. We've hunted Pokemons outside in the public space. VR glasses are coming out by uh, Facebook around about this time. Um, the technology companies are making these glasses and developing this technology. But we uh, believe that this technology should be uh, developed by a broader coalition of people. So we thought, why not lead by design and start a public debate and involve arts, science, government and te small tech as well. So we've got a great show uh, for you today. We've got an hour and we've split it up into four segments. First of all, we're going to talk about science. What is immersive technology? How is it changing our relationships to technology, but also to um, other people around us? And we're going to do this with Professor Rini van Est. He's a professor here at the Technical University in Eindhoven, also affiliated to um, the Ratenau Institute, coordinates digital society. Welcome. Thank you. After that, we are going to speak about arts with uh, Nikki uh, Liebrechts, an artist in residence and also a social designer. What that is and how arts and design can help in this world of immersive technology, how it can make, make it shape. Um, we'll find out in segment two. Then we'll speak to Lisa Cornet from the University of Leiden, who has also worked for the Ministry of Justice and Security. And she basically looks at the question, how can VR specifically um, make us, uh, uh, our society work in a better way and how can it enhance our lives? Fourthly, but not lastly, is Martin Lenz Fitzgerald, who's gonna speak about voice. Um, he's an entrepreneur and uh, has been working on specific projects with seniors and getting them involved in this technology, as well as um, other startups to standardize this technology in the Netherlands. Are we ready for it? So Aye, just yes. delve, delve right in. Okay, let's Do start it. out with Rini. Uh, Rini, the Ratenau Institute, uh, this week published a manifesto on immersive technology. Right. The Ratenau Institute usually makes uh, research reports, uh, briefings to parliaments. A manifesto sounds serious. Yes, Why it, a manifesto? It is. I mean, it sounds serious, but it also sounds playful. Uh, why a manifesto? Because we want to inform a broad public about all kinds of developments going on. The, the common term is immersive technologies, but we're talking about virtual reality, augmented reality. We're talking about voice assistance. Uh, we think this is a very important uh, development because there's a lot of stake. I think what in essence is at stake is uh, our perception of reality. And perception of reality means, I mean, that's, that's the core of what humans are. And who is deciding about what we see in reality? Are big businesses uh, in control? Are citizens in control? So we want to involve citizens in this discussion because we think it's an important discussion. That's why we made a manifesto, and that's why we put in that manifesto 10 societal demands for the future of information society. Great. Before we go into that, in the manifesto, you write that actually we're entering a new phase in this digital society. That's kind of a bold statement. What is going on? It is. We think that, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost commonplace to state that, you know, the physical world and the digital world are converging. But we think that in this new stage, this convergence is even going further. Uh, it's going further because, uh, for example, uh, now, uh, and Martin will, will talk about that, we can talk to computers. I mean, we have been used for millennia that people talk to people. Now people can talk to machines, and machines can talk to people. So that's a radically new thing. Uh, if you talk about virtual reality, we're talking about completely artificial wor worlds that we can experience, that we can walk in, that we can play with. So that, that's a new thing. And with augmented reality, I think that's even a more radical thing but because here we, uh, we have digital layers putting, uh, pu putting over the physical reality 
Eh? We're putting virtual elements, holograms, in the physical reality. So, so actually, that defines how we experience this reality. So these uh, developments mean that this convergence between the physical uh, and the digital worlds is becoming almost complete. And this means that, you know, how can we distinguish between uh, the physical and the virtual world? How can we distinguish between what's real and what's fake? And the umbrella term used here is immersive technology. Right. A lot of technologies are immersive, but how are these specific three technologies, so VR, AR and voice, um, more immersive than others? Uh, uh, these emergent technologies, actually, you can say they, they are defined by three characteristics. And the first characteristic is that uh, for this te technology to work, it's important that all kinds of uh, sensors are used uh, to map uh, bodies, behavior, and the social environments we live in. So it's a kind of, you could say, biometric surveillance technology. That's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is that these technologies are, are all about digital modification. What do I mean? Based on these, uh, this data that are collected, uh, you could say that bodies, faces, voices can be, can be digitally cloned. We can remake these uh, you know, bodies and environments. We can remake them digitally. So we can clone them digitally, but we can also modify them. We can change them. And that means if you're able to do that, you can also man manipulate uh, this digital reality. So that's the second thing digital modification. The third thing is about how do we interact with the computer. That has changed a lot. It will become more intuitive. Think about voice. You know, if you can talk to the machine, you don't have to type in, okay, uh, can I have that website? No, you can just ask for a product or which shop do I have to go to. So this interaction between the machine will become more and more intuitive. Virtual reality is a very good example of that because then you're uh, totally immersed in this virtual reality, this, this artificial world, and you can walk in this. Uh, so uh, the fact that these interfaces are becoming more realistic, more intuitive, also means that uh, it becomes easier to be influenced by these technologies. Yeah, because here I think we should make a bridge to maybe the societal impact of these technologies. This is kind of the basics of how it works. Uh, do you see that these technologies have and will have uh, an impact on how we live together, how we organize our society? Uh, I think there will be a lot of impacts. Of course, we have to discuss these impact, think about it and try to, uh, uh, try to stimulate you know, the positive side of these technologies, because there's, there's a lot of positive things with these technologies, and try to, uh, try to you know, uh, deal with the risks. Uh, these three characteristics I told about actually also show what kind of risks are involved. Uh, the fact that this is a kind of surveillance technology, so it records a lot of uh, biometric uh, issues and a lot of the social environments we are involved in means that privacy, that's an important issue, but uh, technologies like face recognition or emotion recognition, they can be used to identify uh, people. So it's also uh, the anon anonymity if these technologies are used you know, in, in public spaces. Also the anonymity of people uh, is at stake that's one example. And not only of the people using the technology, but also of people that are passers-by. Yes, exactly. Uh, so so that's, that's about the surveillance uh, part of the technology. I mean, the fact that this technology is, is able to you know, influence what we are seeing and what we are experiencing also brings up a lot of questions. Uh, for example, how can we control our own virtual identity? Uh, for example, if you look at this deep nude 
app, mm -hmm. which is able to, you know, uh, take a picture of you, for example, Doya. It's scary if you're pointing it at me, yes. Yes, and then uh, this technology, this app, will, you know, uh, <laughs> will be used to show you naked. I mean, uh, that's, that's an example which you don't have control over that technology, but I think we want to have control about this technology. But what do you so, mean by uh, how could we have control over these kind of things? Well, that's a, big, mean here? that's a big question. I mean, I'm putting this question on the table. I think it's important that, uh, that we stay in control of our virtual uh, identity. How we can put this into practice, that's the second question. Uh, maybe another thing is, okay, uh, how does this influence uh, digital property issues, for example? I mean, if you have a car or a house, can somebody put, you know, nasty words on your door, for example, in augmented reality? Uh, is that allowed or not? Uh, that, that, that kind of thing should be clarified. Uh, things like, uh, how can we distinguish fake between real? I think we have to think about uh, ways how we can make it sure that what is fake uh, can be traced in that sense. So they, those are all kinds of issues that are related to these uh, and, new uh, technologies. For instance, in this last case, who do you see has a responsibility here? Do you think the responsibility should be at the um, developers of the software and the hardware, or should it be government, mm -hmm. or should it be citizens themselves? Can you go on about that a bit? Well, I, th I, I, I think that uh, businesses, industry has, has a large uh, responsible, uh, responsibility with respect to that, but I think also governments should be involved in this discussion. Uh, I think what is needed is have a discussion about what kind of things do we think are fair with these new technologies? Uh, what kind of social etiquette do we need? So we need a public discussion also, but I think also that governments need to put forward, if it's clear, in what kind of direction we want to go, that governments need to be for, uh, need to put forward kind of rules. What do we think is fair? What is just in this new, uh, you know, digital society? Are there any of these um, uh, rules or demands that you put in the manifesto that you would like to highlight? Uh, well, in this manifesto, I think all these ten demands are very important. Uh, one of the demands, I think, is, 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 is very interesting that, you know, uh, digital technologies uh, can be used, uh, you know, to stimulate interaction be between people. But what we have also seen, for example, with smartphones, that uh, in the train, in public transport, or in public, uh, public spaces, that they also uh, kind of uh, put, put down a barrier between uh, people. So one of the issues in this manifesto is uh, is that we want to uh, uh, have that the public space stays public. So we see that uh, if you put a digital layer uh, on the physical space, then the question becomes, okay, is this public space, is this still public? Or is it becoming privatized and commercialized by this digital technology? So one of the claim is, okay, how we can, uh, you know, uh, keep these public spaces public. I think that's a very important uh, thing. I live in The Hague myself, and I remember in 2016 when Pokemon Go came out. <laughs> Within days, there were tens of thousands of Pokemon players going to Kijkduin, which was the new Pokemon capital of the world, or at least of the Netherlands. And um, yeah, the local entrepreneurs like this, but within no time actually uh, there were a lot of irritations because people were peeing against the houses of people and uh, especially going into the nature reserves. And there were no rules and also government was scrambling like what is going on here? All mm -hmm. of a sudden our local terrain has been turned into a game for so many people in the world. Mm. So these kind of, um, should there be regulations for how we uh, implement these technologies then in public space? I think so, but you know, the, the, I think the first thing that needs to be done is, you know, to to imagine even that these things can happen. I mean, Pokemon Go shows how 
how large an impact these technologies can, can, can have. But what kind of impacts do these technologies have? So, so, so what kind of issues should we anticipate on? I think that's an important question. And uh, maybe Nikki is here. So maybe Nikki can think about, you know, tell us how we can anticipate on these, you know, new types of uses of technology and what kind of issues come up with these uh, that's technologies. Good. Let's talk about imaginations with Nikki. But one last question to you, um, Rini. There are, yeah, it's quite a critical development going on. How do you see the future? Are you personally positive and optimistic about the future of our digital society? Uh, well, let me say I'm, I'm hopeful about the future. Uh, I think this struggle about reality I was talking about, I think that's going to be a big struggle. It's going to be an economic struggle, a social and a political struggle. And I think it's important to, to have a discussion about what kind of direction do we want this, you know, this uh, future digital society, uh, what kind of direction should it go? And I think these 10 social demands we put forward in the manifesto, I think they, uh, they give a kind of direction we want to go. And if this is going to, going to be a kind of common idea, Oh, that's the way to go, then I'm very hopeful. That sounds good. Let's go immediately to Nikki. Imagination is necessary. Uh, Nikki uh, Liebrechts, you are a social designer. Let's start out just quickly with that. What is a social designer? <laughs> uh, I think a lot of social designers get this question and always react with the same confusion of uh, how to explain themselves. Um, but I think the work that I do is very much about uh, challenges that we face as a society and that are maybe also not a, an individual's problem but a problem that we all share or a challenge that we all face uh, and in these challenges uh, maybe if it's something like an emerging technology that we don't yet have a frame of reference of and where the discussion is maybe led by the people that shape the technology like a technological company uh, or politicians who are shaping um, rules around this technology, uh, that I want to kind of include the people for whom it may seem far away. So the interventions that I do, uh, they kind of help someone answer the question, but what does it mean for me? And I think in that sense, imagination is really powerful because, um, well, yesterday uh, I got to do an interview where we were talking about dreaming out loud. And in a sense, it is dreaming out loud. It's taking those visions and ideas that we have of the future and turning them into something you can hear or something you can see or something you can smell. And this is how I do research, that I, I find an experiential metaphor for something that we have to deal with and that we can then go into a discussion with together. So instead of one person deciding it, we can sit at a table like this and discuss it with people who don't maybe know something about it. But then first we need visuals, right? And I believe that yeah. you brought a few with, with you. Yes, so maybe, maybe we can... it's good uh, to have a look at one or two of the pictures and you can talk us through it. Yeah, I think maybe it's a good thing to just start with uh, the video that I brought. Because right. I think it helps turn this, this subject uh, into life. Okay, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this video or do you want us to just start it out? I think we can uh, start it, but... Um Buen día, Emilio. ¿Qué puedo hacer por usted? ¿Qué está pasando? Mis puntos están bien. No se preocupe. Sus puntos están seguros conmigo. ¿Le puedo ayudar en algo más, Emilio? Yo no soy Emilio. Yo soy Juliana Restrepo. Por favor, espero. 
Wow, that is quite intense. Lisa, <laughs> is this a world that you would like to live in? Uh, no, I will be uh, too much stimuli for me, I think. <laughs> so this is an example of augmented reality in art. Yes, maybe taken a little bit to the extreme, but it's uh, an, an excerpt from a video called Hyper Reality by uh, Keishi Matsuda. And he actually does a lot of work around helping imagining uh, what a completely augmented reality world could be like. And in this case, we saw someone shopping and they were getting bonus points for the way they shopped and the way they interacted with the shop. Uh, but at some point, their reality changed into the reality of another shopper. So there was a glitch in the system. Uh, and instead of Julia, she was suddenly Emilio. And the thing she heard was different and the way the shop tried to seduce her was different. Um, yeah, and I think this kind of also shows that if we think now that augmented re reality is something that we only experience through our devices and something we can put down, uh, in this reality you see that it's part of the commercial or the everyday landscape. And when it's no longer a thing that you can put down and put away, but it's something you have to function in because otherwise your groceries are too expensive uh, or you uh, don't have the social context that you need as a person. Yeah, uh, yeah then, then you have to be part of this system. It's also what uh, Rimi was talking about earlier already, like if we're living in a world in which our virtual identity, our avatars, our digital world is becoming more and more important, um, who has control over it? Yeah. And who can, you know, what happens if it gets hacked? Yeah. yeah, and then in this case you see uh, the, like the, the visual reality getting influenced and the auditory reality. Uh, but maybe we can show the picture of the person wearing the glasses and the device on their body. Um, maybe we have this picture ready. It's, it's not this one, but the one before. <laughs> yes, this one. Uh, I wanted to show this because it shows us two things. It shows us maybe a more traditional setup where a person is wearing a device and the device is influencing their reality. So if you see on the left, uh, this is the Meta Cookie project by Cyber Interface Lab. And they made actually glasses that could change uh, the way you see the food that you eat, but also the, the things that you smell. So by eating a plain cookie, but changing the smell of the cookie and changing the visual thing, you would think you were eating a large cookie or a lemon flavored or a chocolate cookie. Uh, so it's not just in, in auditory or visual things, but it can also be in smell and in taste. And this technology is very much about changing the composition of the sensorial information you have. And then on the right we see Prosthesis for Instincts. Uh, it's a project by Susanna Hedrich. And there she said, well, if we can not just change the things we sense, but we can extend it, um, yeah, can we maybe uh, experience more of the world than we can experience right now? So. Uh, what you see is a device that can give you goosebumps and this goosebumps device can be connected to all kinds of abstract danger. So maybe it's uh, your stock market crashing or it's losing followers on Instagram. And so she says basically that people have these instincts for danger, uh, but the everyday life has completely different dangers than we used to have when we were maybe more primitive people, or maybe we still are primitive people, but these instincts just have to be rewired. So she's saying, changing these senses, how does it connect to the instincts we have as, as people? This is also very much in line with what we were discussing uh, earlier, that um, these kind of technologies are changing your perception. They're digitally modifying what you see, what you hear, what you experience, maybe even yes. what you think and how you deal with it. So they're yeah. powerful uh, visuals. But um, how can kind of these kind of artworks chip into the discussion on how we should um, go about this technology? Yeah, I think um, and maybe it's good also to show the second picture now because I think it, uh, it can learn us a bit about this. It's a technology that's uh, working against us right now because it's another picture. <laughs> <laughs> this one, yeah. So... Um, uh, in this case, like what I want to do with this, this residency that I'm doing for Radenau Institute is look very much not just at these futuristic devices that you may saw in the last picture, but help us imagine kind of 
uh, a reality that is already there or that was already there that we can learn from on how to handle our future. So what are the metaphors we can use that will help us discuss this augmented reality? And I think uh, only seeing those uh, big devices on faces and heads and phones can kind of distract us from the way it can very kind of sneakily manipulate our senses. So if we, for example, look back in history and look at shamans, so on the left you see a shaman, a Siberian shaman. The shaman is the person who interfaces between the real world and the spiritual world. And in a sense, the shaman makes his body the interface to this different world. And actually, this is a thing that we are also talking about and that Rini also mentioned. Uh, the interfaces are getting closer and closer to our bodies. And it's no longer a big step that you take to enter this other reality, but you can immerse yourself in it very quickly and you can c maybe control it with your body. So you become the interface in which you interact with this other world. And so in order to do that, your senses need to get information from this other world. Uh, another design example is the project on the right by Alvan Arthur. It's called body processing and he proposes that we can program through choreography. Mm. So not just by typing and, and making a program, but actually by using our bodies yeah. uh, and then programming and creating an, a new program. And this is maybe a good bridge to the next step because... Yeah, like, because this is actually also happening in uh, patenting of uh, gestures all kinds of ways like like Google has got this wink in which you can kind of control what's going on in the world and also the heart shaped there was a patenting action yeah uh, around this so I see that there's a relationship between this can and there's also a question like can you patent uh, behavior yeah and, and and maybe it's also about patenting not just gestures but also voice for example like what if we start to patent words that we and then when, when someone is using this world who is not interacting with this technology, like these realities start to kind of conflict with each other. Like, is it something we, um, yeah, we, we uh, demand everyone is included in or will the realities become very personal and will they become very much for the individual? Martin, is this in line, what is happening in the voice world? Is this ring a bell? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yes, yes, I think uh, uh, just, cloning of, of voices, things like that. Very scary if you look at it in a negative way. And uh, yeah, it's, but on the other hand, it's very exciting. I mean, we're, we're becoming bilingual maybe in a way where we know the old world as we grew up, but we're learning what that new world is and interfacing. I really like that shaman principle and we're all becoming maybe the shaman between the old world, at least for me anyway, when you had three TV channels and the one where you have multiple realities and time and, and, and multiple dimensions. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and uh, the, the interesting thing about the rituals around shamanism uh, and also the project of Alpha is uh, that it's, um, uh, it's more a social practice also than it's not an individual uh, interacting with one device, but maybe it's multiple individuals erecting, uh, uh, erecting <laughs> acting around a device. Um, so in this this project on the right, you can imagine doing the choreography together and in the sense of shamanism, we can already look at kind of the social rituals they have formed around interfacing with another world. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is then a good uh, bridge to the things that I am doing right now. Yeah, we want to hear more about you because you've just started the artist in residency yes. at the Now Institute. Yeah, and what today is, is the also idea? the first time that uh, I get to see my colleagues live yes. because... Um, <laughs> And that I can socially interface with you guys on the subject that I'm doing. Um, I'm looking to make an experience that very much draws on what we already know about senses and where we can kind of connect this topic of how do we handle interacting with augmented reality through a very social sensorial experience. So that's what I'm designing right now. And uh, currently, I'm very much inspired by restaurants and specifically omakase Japanese restaurants because um, it's a restaurant where you sit together on a table and the chef prepares the food in front of you. And just like an augmented reality where you collect ingredients, you collect data, uh, 
someone prepares the ingredients, they modify this data, uh, and they present it back to you. And that's maybe the food, and you can eat the food, and you can interact. Um, and then we can also start to talk about etiquette and how do we eat this together. And maybe if I can make food out of my data, I can let you taste my food and I can taste your food. And we get to experience each other's reality. So it's not just a very individualistic version of reality, but like in uh, Elvin's project or the shaman, it's something we together can do as a social ritual. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we can sit together and we can discuss uh, how we want to handle this this future. I'm looking forward to taste some of your work. <laughs> but um, uh, what a question for me in this artist in residency is also, um, what can the surplus value be of artists and scientists working together? Yeah, I think where uh, I think when we talk about metaphors, it's something in which we are very much similar. And I think I can consider myself a design research, researcher, so I use designed objects as a tool to research. And in my case, the metaphor is not something I use uh, as uh, a discussion tool or something that I just talk about, but I try to make it sensorial. I try to make it so that you can experience it through your senses. And I think in the examples that, that we see uh, on the, on the, um, that I brought with me, yeah, humans are very much a sensorial, sense-making beings. So in order for us to not just imagine the future, but to experience it, uh, I think their designers and artists can help into turning those things into a reality so we can experience it together and we can have it on our tables and, and discuss it together. Thanks, thanks for now. And feel free to chip in to the rest of the discussion. Let's go back to the sciences to Lisa Cornet, working at the University of uh, Leiden. And you've done extensive work with your colleagues on the application of VR and how it can enrich our lives. Let's start with that question. How can VR, how can enrich, VR our lives? enrich Oh, That's a very broad question. <laughs> Maybe I should bring that down to uh, first, let me say something a bit more about virtual reality, because I'm not sure if everyone who's listening, who's watching this video is aware what is virtual reality, what is it actually as a concept. Um, maybe it's good to know that virtual reality is everywhere, it's always around us. It's also uh, the things we see on our screens, on our laptops, on smartphones. And here we talk about more about immersive virtual reality that you can experience with these goggles, these headsets, and I think that's the, the concept we put central here. But but it's it's good to know that virtual reality is, is everywhere. It's not only the headsets that we uh, that we use. Um, um, I'll come back to the question. But first, I would like to say a bit more about the, the concept of virtual reality and what is so powerful about it, and then how we can use it to enrich our lives. But it's a super powerful technology, immersive virtual reality, because, and that's actually in line with what Nikki told, is that it can sort of blur the line between reality and illusion. And that's not something we can do with any other technology, with augmented reality, of course. But blurring the line between reality and illusion, that is not so possible with your smartphone or what you see in the television screen. You can sort of, it approaches the level of blurring this line, but with immersive virtual reality, that is possible. And it actually, it's, tri it's about tricking the brain. Uh, I have a background in neuroscience, and with that background, I find it super interesting to see what virtual reality does to our brain. Um, the thing about immersive virtual reality is once you put on the goggles, uh, your vision, our most dominant sense of one of our most dominant senses, is shut off from the real world. And that means you are, within a few seconds, you are absorbed in that virtual world uh, without knowing it. It's, it's happening on an unconscious level. You're absorbed in that virtual world while your body is still in your living room. Our mind cannot be at two places at one time. So the result is that you are in that virtual world. And we if need that some examples here, I think. Or yeah. Could you illustrate this by this tricking and this powerful form of immersion by telling us? Well, I think there's a well-known example of, of experience of roller coaster, for instance, in virtual reality. I think people may be aware with that example. And 
if you experience a roller coaster uh, in virtual reality, the thing is while you're standing in your virtual in your living room, uh, you do feel uh, you getting you get nauseous because uh, there is a, a moving uh, screen in front of you. You feel like you're in that roller coaster, um, so so your body really reacts to that, and that can be actually pretty dangerous because you're trying to. Uh, mimic these movements that you're making in the virtual world while you're still standing in 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 your living room and i will have more examples uh, later on um, also to relate it to more things that people may be more aware of is if you are in virtual reality you might feel present in the virtual world and that's a feeling that you can compare to uh, reading for instance a very interesting book or seeing an exciting movie then you can also experience a level of presence really being into that story the only difference with virtual reality is that in the real world there can still be distractions from the real world like a cat jumping from the couch or an alarm in somewhere in the streets while in virtual reality especially in immersive virtual reality there are no distractions anymore from the real world so you're fully absorbed in that virtual world and interesting thing here is that if you feel present in that virtual world it's highly likely that you start to show emotions and start to show behavior that are similar to what you would like to, to what you will show in the real world and that offers opportunities to actually enhance behavior and cognition that's yeah. the good side that's there interesting because yeah, that's, that's what i would like to focus on like uh, what effects does this immersion have on our behavior yeah. how can it be used yeah. maybe in forms of therapy or yeah, so together with my research is actually we came up with uh, two interesting metaphors, metaphors so to say. Uh, so if you can create an experience that people feel present in, then you can transport people to a total different world. Um, that could be just for fun, being transported in virtual reality to a tropical beach and experience the white sand and the blue sea. But you can also create learning environments where people can practice specific skills. Think of a surgeon who needs to practice specific procedures. And in a virtual reality environment, this surgeon can practice this specific skill over and over again without putting a real patient in danger. Um, so interesting, interestingly enough you, can, enough, you can create a realistic learning environment. And... Um, one thing to practice skills, but also, for instance, to enhance behavior or to overcome specific emotions. And there's an interesting example I would like to show uh, where virtual, is, virtual reality is used in the clinical setting to help people deal with anxiety disorder. And there's an interesting video clip that shows the usage of virtual reality to help people with uh, anxiety disorder. So I believe we have it. I yeah. think we can play it. Yeah. So we start, start taking some small arms fire, contact right, start engaging up top, start engaging, Con contact left, start engaging, uh, one guy hitting the back behind us. One thing I've learned from VR is that it's very easy to fool the brain. There's remnants of uh, soldiers, uh, enemy soldiers on the ground everywhere and it's very kind of surreal, kind of like, I don't, like I'm not really there. If you do VR well, they engage in the environment as if it's the real thing. It's evocative of the emotions that that environment is designed to provoke or induce. Yeah, so this is an example of how VR is used in the clinical setting to treat post-traumatic stress disorder among veterans. Um, and Skip Rizzo, Professor Skip Rizzo, who's working on this project in California, uh, I've, I was able to visit him and also experience this uh, virtual reality environment. How was it? It was intense, yeah. Uh, of, of course, it's not a situation I'm familiar with, uh, walking around this, this environment, um, but it was pretty intense with all the sounds and it, it, that's, I think it's hard to explain the power of VR if you're not in it, but it really appeals to all your senses. Um, and in this case, although you might think, well, this doesn't look very realistic, right? This environment, that doesn't really matter actually, because your brain will fill up the gaps and will you will use your own experience and emotions that will all break, brought back, uh, will all come up again. And with help of a clinician, 
uh, these veterans are able now to deal with the emotions and deal with the anxiety that they uh, suffer from uh, after being in that situation. Interestingly enough, it, there is a lot of research showing that virtual reality is actually very effective in treating this kind of anxiety disorder and as effective as regular therapy. And sometimes there is uh, there is also research showing that it's even more effective uh, when it comes to reducing anxiety-related disorder. Also, for instance, fear of heights. It's a very interesting um, uh, tool, uh, tool to use virtual reality to reduce specific phobias. Uh, and the cool thing about VR is that you can create an environment that is highly controlled. So a developer or a clinician can uh, think of what should be in there and personalize it for the, for the specific patient that needs to be uh, trained in how to learn dealing with these fear, emotions of fear. Um, and that way VR offers an opportunity to have controlled, personalized situations that can be uh, used over and over again. Uh, actors don't need it anymore. The situation is always there. There's interesting things in, also um, in the beginning you were talking about the visual layers that are coming to you, but here in this example, it's not only visual, it's also very strongly audio. Yeah. And I believe also olfactory, right? It's also... Yeah, there are also some studies or experiments uh, yeah, research project that use also olfactory, uh, so stimulate the the the, the smell. Because I think the more you engage all our senses, the more realistic, of course, it feels, and the more immersive it gets. And in order to affect, and in this case, in order to enhance uh, the way people can deal with emotions or or or, or uh, transform their behavior, you want to be as realistic as possible or, or be immersive as possible and then appealing to all these senses is helpful to make it a very intense experience and of course there's also the relevance of a clinician here that's very important to to mention uh, this shouldn't be done alone there's always some guidance needed and actually that's also some of the risk that was mentioned before it shouldn't be used on its own because it's it's super intense and it needs guidance so in your research i also saw this term of the proteus effect which is also very much about this immersive mm -hmm. capacity. Well, maybe you can explain a yeah. bit more about yeah, it. Yeah, so, so we talked about transportation, being transported to a different situation that can be done with virtual reality. But in virtual reality, you can also transform. You can transform into another entity. Um, and there are some interesting uh, research studies out there showing that if you transform into, for instance, a very tall avatar, uh, and you step into a negotiation game, and the avatar in front of you is much smaller than you are. It seems that people are more assertive in their negotiation. And that has to do with uh, the fact, the psychological effect that once you uh, step into an avatar, you start to behave and show emotions that are in line with the stereotype ID you have about that avatar. So we have a stereotype ID that tall people have more self-confidence uh, and putting yourself into the shoes of someone who is much taller in this case than in a smaller avatar, you start to end, sort of live out the stereotype ID you have. And I wish I could have practiced this discussion beforehand in VR. So <laughs> yeah, but you're already that. tall. So that's, that's, that's true, yeah. that's true. <laughs> yeah. Rini mentioned in his uh, talk also that there were some risks and some um, yeah, uh, challenges with yeah. this technology. Did you also find these in your studies? Of course. So yeah. So together with our with the researchers and my colleagues, we also invest. I mean, there is a lot of potential here, and uh, VR is a very promising tool in order to enhance our lives. But there are some risks, and I think Rini already mentioned very crucial ones. But I would like to add to that that we are not so much aware right now of the emotional and psychological side effects of this technology on the long term. So we do know it's it's a very intense technology, and you can use it for the goods. But there's not so much research out there showing what are actually the, the psychological and emotional side effects. And to just name one is that, and we already talked about it before, is that there is also some research showing that, for instance, children are not able to uh, see the difference, really see the difference between fantasy and, and reality. So what happens if children are exposed to this kind of technology where they can see all kinds of worlds, but they also will develop some memories related to that virtual or fantasy worlds. And 
the risk is that some sort of false memories will develop that were not based on reality, but were based on the fantasy worlds that can be created. Are there examples of these false memories that uh, are studied? Yeah, I think you had an example. Well, in our um, research on VR, we found one of Bailey and Balenson. Exactly. And it was a study in which uh, children were exposed to a virtual reality setting in which they were swimming with orcas, or at least they were around orcas. And a couple of days later, they were asked, what did you experience? They did experience um, and memorize the experience with orcas, but not that it was in virtual reality. Exactly. So in that sense, it was also a form of uh, yeah. false memories. Yeah, that's a form of false memory. So well, why is that false? Because it's an actual memory. Yeah, but they didn't distinguish anymore between reality and virtuality. Yeah. But for them, it was real. It's a, it's a real memory. That there's nothing false. It's not a yeah. memory. It, the memory itself wasn't false. Uh, so maybe the term false memory is not correct here. But at least it's a memory based on fantasy and and, and, and virtual uh, uh, experience that is now sort of co um, connected to the real world. And. Uh, I think that's open for discussion. Is that good or bad? At least it's happening. It can happen. So it's, we should be aware of these effects. Uh, so that's the general comment I would like to make, psychological, social and emotional side effects. And then maybe it's good to come back to, to, to the general comment that if we design virtual environments, it's really necessary that we do this in uh, together with of course the research behind it but also in line with the knowledge of developers also practice or policy makers who are involved in it and also the target group i'm not sure we don't talk about target groups right now but if we design specific environments for instance to in this case reduce anxiety disorder then people uh, that we target these interventions for should be involved in the developing process so i think that's that's an important thing i would like to mention i think that's a great uh, final note okay. thanks a lot yeah. Lisa. Let's move on to voice. Do Martin Lenz Fitzgerald and his voice. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome once again. Um, uh, you have been working on the voice tech community in the Netherlands a lot with different projects. But let me also start with this first question. How do you think that uh, voice technology can enrich our society? Uh, I think voice is like any new medium, like any new channel. It will happen anyway so it will be part of us we will have avatars talking to us i just downloaded an app today where i can leave voice messages on location for people telling you that the left bathroom is not working if you go there and you have it on and you have your ear piece in and uh, it's the most natural way to interact with technology and that way actually it's also the most human uh, technology uh, or interface uh, out there right now. So it's going to be very persuasive. Everybody will talk to their machines, their things. Uh, and, and in that sense, it's really powerful to look at it because if you think about, uh, for instance, uh, VR or AR, that's a lot of work to make. Whereas voice is pretty natural already. We've been working with voice so much as a channel, as a medium. And so voice content, literally what I'm saying right now, that's, that's not that hard maybe to make even compared to those complex, immersive technologies. So therefore, I think it's going to be very, very persuasive. And uh, talking about making it, we've been speaking earlier about the role of big tech companies in this immersive tech sector. Um, so it's a highly competitive market. Can you tell us something about the Dutch market? Is that also dominated by big tech companies or? Within voice, and, and yeah, I was just listening to this too. Um, so here in Holland, the voice market, there is, they're there, but the largest investments, if you just look at amount of resources put to the problems of voice, the technology problems, that's done by the big tech, pl uh, tech platforms, there are, there is kind of spread around some research being done in Amsterdam, in, in, in Leeuwarde, or in Groningen and Leeuwarden, uh, Eindhoven and uh, uh, Nijmegen. Um, and there are some companies doing specific work, but not hardcore focused en endeavors, no, as compared to, of course, the big pl tech platforms. Mm -hmm. And does this market uh, take societal aspects also into account? I believe it definitely does. Uh, um, I'm, I'm working, for instance, with a new initiative called the Dutch Voice Coalition. 
And that is looking to see with government, with scientists uh, and organizations, commercial organizations, what can we do ourselves? Because we shouldn't be dependent on the large platforms. We should do it ourselves. And the large platforms think we are the, the, the capital of Denmark anyway, so we need to take care of ourselves and not be dependent. And one of my biggest surprises is if you look at our Dutch language and the Dutch language model, which is what the machine needs to be able to understand us and talk back, there is no central agency uh, or, or organization that takes care of this. So in, 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 in old, old speech, you have, or old writing, you have the Groene Boekje, for instance. Well, what is the green book for, for technology to talk well? And, uh, or to understand well, or to speak back well. And that's one of the things that we're doing with the voice commons is to make sure, or to research and figure out what we need to do to, to really yeah, make sure that we control that as a country, as, as the people who have languages, but also think about the specific uh, uh, local languages, the dialects or, or, or just differences in speech uh, by people, for instance, elderly versus kids, or people within media versus people in banks and bank services. They're all different languages and all in a technical way that needs to be recorded and made available so anybody can make services for that. So would it be kind of a database of all kinds of voice data? Well, that's the dream of the Voice Coalition, is that uh, maybe we can create together an open set of data that anybody can use to create voice services. And a good example is the Mozilla. Uh, uh, they have the voice commons. And uh, I think Frisian language is already being made there. But uh, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing, but more structured and, and very much also with the organizations who need it. And you mentioned also the elderly. You've been doing a big project uh, on voice yeah. with the elder community uh, of the Netherlands. Yeah. Silver. Yes, Project Silver with a Z, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a good video of that. Let's start with that. Every day I try to learn something new. I'm 73. <laughs> Hey Google, wat wordt het weer? Op dit moment is het 20 graden en half bewolkt in Amsterdam. Technology is part of my life. Mm -hmm. Project Silver, mm -hmm. they gave a workshop. They teach me how can I use it in my daily things. Hey Google, set tomaten op mijn lijstje. When you get older, you want to be independent. Everything is changing so fast. If you don't try to keep up a little bit, then you lose contact with the world. Technology can help, but if you don't know it, that's a problem. Hi, Annika. Yeah. Um, so, when I started out in voice, really in the beginning already, I had the idea like, whoa, this is a technology, a channel, an interface that can for the first time enable people instead of stopping people. If you think about people who can't really see well or who tremble or, or yeah, have, have issues that not everybody has, uh, they don't know what a hamburger, hamburger menu is. They can't pinch, swipe, or understand the, the, the banking system with your, your cards and everything else and your computer. So what if older adults actually can now jump back into the world because our blend in technology world is actually also a barrier for some. And that's where Project Silver came about, where uh, we are researching basically the how can voice technology help older adults. Uh, we're doing that with Google, with Achmea, uh, the insurer, the social bank, the SVB here in Holland that pays out all the pensions to people, so they have a lot of information, and the Dutch elderly organization, the Anbo. And um, the first thing we did was do a research, basically, is there uh, something to solve? Is this something for older people? And in short, yes, one in five of the 2,000, 3,000 people that we, we talked to or we, we, we uh, researched, they already talked to a device. Mm -hmm. And we, this is three years ago or two years ago. Um, and, and so many things that people wanted. And, and you think, of course, like less loneliness, just the thing saying good morning back in the morning is so powerful. And that is one of the cool insights with Project Silver is yes, voice technology is a way for older people to do more than that they did before. Um, and it, it enhances their quality of life. 
And yeah. uh, specifically if you're lonely, for instance, and that was yeah, one of the surprising things that we found out. Disclaimer is I have one of these voice assistants in the house and in the morning when I wake up I say good morning and it tells me the weather, it tells me uh, the news and it tells me my first appointments and also the exact time. And uh, especially in these times of corona, it is you feel a kind of companionship. Yeah. At the same time, it also touches on this topic of surveillance because as soon as you say something, it responds. Yeah. If you, if you don't say the right command, it doesn't respond, but it's still maybe a recording. Yeah. So these are also issues that, especially in a project with uh, elderly, is, are important to yeah. um, take into account, I would say. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we literally uh, noticed that within the project. For instance, when we uh, started a giveaway at the beginning of the corona crisis, we gave away 10,000 smart speakers for free. And we had this press release that we used the Onbo as the channel. And uh, nobody from the media published the press release because they also saw that Google was part of it and maybe they didn't trust it, I don't know, but we did not get any coverage or hardly. There was one outlet that kind of did something. Not that it was needed, within a day and a half it was, they were all gone. And by the way, 71% of the people that got it said that their la life was enhanced and better than before due to the speaker. But uh, I think regarding privacy and, and the gathering of data, I mean, all these technologies won't work without data. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, like, like I imagine in the Middle Ages, at some point, some, some, some person in a church thought, let's record all the deaths and all the births. And, and they had no clue what kind of impact that ha had or, or think about uh, what, what before the war had no risk regarding uh, what kind of uh, uh, religious affiliation you had in the good administration here in Holland and what kind of effects that had later on. Um, now, and that's also where I'm very active with voice, is that um, personally I think social media and mobile media went wrong in the sense that they're the ultimate data gathering misusing or tools that are misused by corporations. As in, if I open my phone, I, all my senses are misused to do more. And I forgot that I was just looking up a phone number and I'm checking Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's not right. And I think with voice, because it's emerging and that's what I'm doing, I'm really trying to see how can we make it better than all the other ones? How can we apply the lesson so we don't misuse it? And, and what is we in this uh, question? Like, <laughs> who can work together and how can we realize this? Do you well, see a I, role there for our government or for technology companies or, and how can they collaborate? I think that's a great question. Um, so I think the government specifically here in Europe is a very important player here. Although it's also very hard because look at how many cookie uh, things you have to click away when you're looking at the news right now online. So it has no successful track record in that, but they have that guardian function in a way for the commons or for the public spaces. And you should not leave that just to the technology parties, uh, platforms that are outside of, of the country even, that do not have any real stake on a societal level in that, uh, rolling out that technology. So for instance, with the voice commons uh, and a little bit with the project silver, I try to involve everybody in these movements. And I think with such movements, also what we're doing here today, as well as the manifesto, that's the way to get it on the agenda, to get into really what are the implications of the new media, the new channels. And if I look at it right now, the parties that have the resource, the resources to do hardcore deep research are the technical commercial platforms in California and maybe some in China. And I hope that somehow here in Holland, for instance, or in Europe, we can actually form some kind of way to do it yeah, ourselves too. And in that, in a different way. I mean, if you just look at identification, how that is being done right now in the digital world, there's always a third party with not your intent uh, uh, initially uh, who's facilitating that. So what if we come up, can come up with an Instagram that everybody wants, as in everybody wants Instagram and has installed it, but then you, you manage your identity with, that, with it without having any third party trying to deal with it unless you want to. So... Imagine the power of a Google, a Facebook, or an Amazon facilitating you with the identity services to manage all, all the data that we just discussed. 
that's, I think, a great conundrum that d that needs deep research from all the uh, stakeholders involved. Yeah. Marty, you were working in 2005 already on Layar and this company that was one of the biggest in augmented reality. You've been called a visionary. What is your uh, take on the future? How will technology, and especially, specifically this voice technology, progress in our society? Yeah, I think in the future we will talk more with devices than uh, with our partners. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, that's okay. I think uh, we, on one hand, will become bilingual, being able to live in both worlds. We need to teach our kids. My son pl is more online than outside, and I can judge that. But he has friends now that he's never seen in England, and a very nice girl, I think. And, and he's happy with that. His reality is therefore blended and very different than ours. Great. We have to... Uh oh. Yeah. Cut off, but uh, thanks a lot uh, for this. We've heard a lot about the future, but I think also the future is really now. So we should uh, be talking about what we should be doing now. And um, I think if there's one message that we have to take out of this is that we have to do this together. So we have to enrich reality by means of immersive technology together. And I think that is the point that we'll close off at. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.